We had a huge loss in the wrestling world this week. And I was thinking about this. You know, what made wrestling so great to me as a kid, and honestly, even still to this day as an adult, what made wrestling so great to me was the characters. Wrestling is full of characters of all kinds. Mean Gene Okerlund, who passed away this week at the age of 76, was a character in front of the camera, off camera. They, they don't make him like Gene anymore. And it's another name from my childhood gone. I know a lot of you were in the same boat as, as I am. Uh, mean Gene was as much of a reason as Hulk Hogan, Macho Man, or, or Andre the Giant of why I am a wrestling fan today. In fact, when guys like Hogan came over, Gene literally came over with him. It was almost like part of a package deal. So when those guys all came over to WWF and changed the whole landscape, uh, the first faces that you think of and that you saw and that I saw were people like Mean Gene Okerlund and Lord Alfred Hayes and Gorilla Monsoon and Jesse Ventura and Bobby Heenan and Hulk Hogan and Roddy Piper and Randy Savage and so on and so forth. Gene was part of that whole package. And I always used to think when I was a kid, they, you know, you always think, oh, one day I'm going to, maybe I'll be a wrestler one day. I never thought I was going to be a wrestler. I knew I, I couldn't be a wrestler. I wasn't going to be a wrestler. If anything, I thought I'll be more like that Mean Gene guy one day where I'll be holding a microphone in my hand. If I was ever going to aspire to be anything in, in, in wrestling, it would have been that, not a wrestler. Um, in the last few years, we've really lost some truly big names in the wrestling business. If you think about it, going back, I think the last three years or so, Rowdy Roddy Piper, Dusty Rhodes, Bruno San Martino, Bobby the Brain Heenan, and now Mean Gene Okerlund. And this one was a tough pill to swallow. And it is very eerie after I had just gotten done talking about him in the mailbag on last week's show when I was running down all of the funny corpsing moments and bloopers in WWE history from, and a lot of them I credited to, to Gene. And I pointed out three or four specific ones, specifically for me and Gene Okerlund, you know, for you to go back and, and kind of go hit YouTube and check out. And I also talked about how there really is not anyone even comparable to him on television today. And those people are the ones that you know are great at what they do. The ones that you praise and you talk about when they're still alive and not just after they pass away. So it actually kind of makes me feel happy that I was talking about him a week ago uh, before any of this happened. Gene was in a class all by himself. Tony Schiavone, I thought, said it best on Twitter this week. Uh, when he called Gene, he said, then, now, and forever, basically, pro wrestling's greatest stick man. Now, of course, you, you know, you, you don't count the wrestlers in that. I wouldn't put Gene as a stick guy ahead of somebody like Ric Flair. That's not what he meant. But on the microphone, promoting and doing interviews with the talent, there has never been anyone better. And there likely never will be anyone better. And I feel pretty content in saying that because, and it's not, I'm not just saying that because, oh, nostalgia. I'm not just saying that because I grew up on the guy. Yes, I, I like many of you, will have a certain affinity to the people I grew up on. If you grew up as a wrestling fan in the mid to late 90s, then you probably wax nostalgic about the Monday Night Wars. If you were a WCW fan, you remember Nitro. If you were a wrestling fan in general, you remember the Attitude Era and all that. And that was a lot of fun. Not what I grew up on as a young kid, but some of you might have. So yeah, you're always going to have an affinity uh, for what you... And think about that, by the way, because you know there are people growing up right now thinking that Monday Night Raw in 2018, uh, in 2019, is just the greatest thing in the world. That, now that's scary. That's scary. But it's not just that. I'm not just saying there'll never be another like Mean Gene Okerlund because uh, of a nostalgia thing. There truly is nobody who does what he did anymore. That's over. That is dead. It is a lost art. Those people simply do not exist. WWE does not allow them to exist. So I feel pretty content in saying that Gene's record and his position as best of all time is pretty safe and sound because he has no competition. If there's no one to compete against you, then they can't be better than you. You know, guys like him and Howard Finkel, it's less about what you can do and more about what you look like these days. You certainly will not find anybody who looks like Mean Gene on 
you know, television these days. And that doesn't just go for WWE either, by the way. Whether it's him or it's the Fink, let that be a lesson to all you people aspiring to do what he did. Apparently being bald with a mustache is the kiss of death in wrestling today. And it's real easy to say, oh, you can't just go back in time, like I'm sure many of us would love to. Uh, just because it worked 30 years ago, times change, interview styles evolve, it doesn't mean it's going to work today. And that's true, not everything that worked back then would necessarily work today in 2019. But I guarantee you, I guarantee you that if WWE had someone like a Mean Gene in their stable, and they produced and shot segments the way that they did back then with him, and they had somebody with a spine, and they had somebody with a personality all of their own, who could get the most out of the talent that they have, the, the way that Gene used to have a knack for doing, the product today would be a whole lot better off for it. You cannot challenge me when I say that, because what I, when I say that, it's 100% right, and you know it's 100% right, and they know it's 100% right, and yet they won't do it. But... This is not about WWE today. I don't want to go off on that too much. This is about me and Gene Okerlund. Now, he had a lot of health issues over the years. Uh, according to his son, he had a total of three kidney transplants. I, I knew of two. I didn't know he had a third. Uh, in his Hall of Fame speech, he kind of mentioned, at one point, he briefly alluded to having had two. So if there was a third one, then it would have had to have been within the last decade. Uh, of course, the human body, uh, most human bodies anyway, only have two kidneys. So that tells you the kind of problems that he had with his kidneys over the years. Uh, his son told a local TV station in Minneapolis that his father had a fall uh, about three weeks ago, broke multiple ribs. His health wasn't really all that great to begin with. Uh, he was very frail. Uh, the fall just made things that much worse. You hear, that, you hear about that a lot. Uh, even in my own family, I can remember stories of, I think, my great-grandmother. You know, when you have a fall especially if you hit your head or, or you suffer some kind of serious injury. You hear about an older person having a fall. It's not a good thing. And uh, in Gene's case, it just sort of began this downward spiral for him. And then four days before he died, he was admitted to a nursing home. Uh, the day that he died, he was complaining of uh, having trouble breathing. They rushed him to a hospital, and he passed away not long after that. Uh, he had no background in wrestling when Vern Gagne asked him to fill in as an announcer one week on his AWA TV show. Uh, his announcer was out for whatever reason that week. Gene was working at that television station doing something completely different. I think he was working in sales. And Vern just said to him, look, uh, have you done this before? He said, no, I, he's never called wrestling a day in his life. He doesn't know anything about it. And Gagne just said to him, look, just call what you see. And that was how he got his start in the wrestling business. Just call what you see. What a novel concept. Uh, Jesse the Body Ventura, he is the man who came up with the nickname Mean Gene. It was not Hulk Hogan. That, that was a Jesse Ventura thing. There was a promo in the AWA where he once referred to him as the, uh, the Mean Gene hot air machine. And so that's where the nickname came from. And one of the great things about watching old Mean Gene interviews, uh, and it stands out more so uh, today, obviously, he rarely, if ever, let the wrestlers push him around or bully him around. He stood up to them. He wasn't just a warm body in a suit. He had his own personality. Uh, when a heel did something dastardly, not, not that he would never, you know, feign uh, fear, but when a wrestler would, would do something really dastardly and vicious, he would react like it. You know, he would sell it and put it over by letting everybody know what an awful, terrible human being that he thought that person was. He did it with Jake the Snake Roberts at that Tuesday in Texas show after Jake slapped Elizabeth in the face and he came to the back and Gene, you know, had to interview him and he called him a bona fide sicko. And at the very end, he's, you know, Jake's talking about, oh, I want to touch her again and Gene just refused to even continue the promo. He said, I'm not, I don't want to talk to you anymore. He said, get the hell out of here. He reacted the way that you or I would react if we were in a situation like that. We wouldn't want to be around somebody like that. Uh, in his Hall of Fame speech, uh, Gene said that while Jesse Ventura came up with the name Mean Gene, he said it was Hulk Hogan who etched the name in granite, which is 100% which is true. Hogan was the man who inducted Gene into the Hall of Fame back in 2006. The two of them were 
thick as thieves. They were linked throughout their entire careers going back to the AWA. Uh, when Hogan jumped over to Vince McMahon, he put a word in with Vince and Pat Patterson that he wanted Okerlund to come over with him. And Gene said that he ended up making almost three times the amount of money he was making in the AWA to go work for Vince McMahon. That doesn't happen were it not for Hulk Hogan. And so when you think about Hogan and the stories about him, you know, putting other people down and holding them down, he certainly treated his friends like they were royalty. You look at some of his friends in the business, Brutus Beefcake and, and other people, uh, he certainly took care of his own. I will say that about Hogan. He, he, he took care of his own. And let's be honest here. Hogan was a smart enough guy. He was a smart enough guy to understand that somebody like Gene was going to help him immensely. Was going to help get him over as a big star immensely. He was not a threat to him. He was not threatening his spot. Hogan knew what he was doing. And he was smart to want Gene to come over. Uh, Gene really, in a, in a lot of ways, became a very integral part of his shtick. He became a very integral part of his act. Uh, you know, and, and he would go, well, let me tell you something mean, Gene. Right? Those eight words, I can't tell you how many times I heard those eight words in my childhood as a wrestling fan. Uh, for all the promos they did together, I still remember the time that Gene saved him during a promo. It was the 91 Royal Rumble. And Hogan blanked he couldn't remember Saddam Hussein's name this is when they were doing the whole you know Gulf War angle with Iraq and everything and he couldn't remember Saddam Hussein's name he stumbled a rare stumble in a Hulk Hogan promo and Gene tried his best to cover for him and even then when Hogan suddenly got it he still fucked it up he called him like Sudan Hussein <laughs> just I just like I'm imagining him saying it in my head and it makes me laugh he called him Sudan Hussein Maybe that was Saddam's wife, Sue. I, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, uh, this leads into uh, a news item here, which is that WWE has announced that Hulk Hogan is coming back to Monday Night Raw, at least for one night. Tomorrow night, he is returning to Raw to pay tribute to Mean Gene Okerlund. And this has a lot of people up in arms. Now, let me just say this. Do I think that this is part of, or that part of this is WWE jumping at the chance to bring back Hulk Hogan to television with the least possible risk of him being booed. Yes, of course it is. You'd have to be blind not to see that. And I don't think it's a way to get him back on television right now in a recurring role. For now, this is a one and done type of thing. Although I do think he'll be at WrestleMania, but I'll get to that in my predictions. But this, think about it, this is the safest way, not that they planned that they knew Mean Gene was going to die, but this is the safest way for them to get him back on TV. Absolutely. Absolutely. We saw him at Crown Jewel. There was no mention. They waited until the last possible second to announce that, hey, Hulk Hogan is going to host Crown Jewel. And we all know what a shit show that whole pay-per-view was. But they didn't really promote that hardly in advance. They didn't say a word about Hulk Hogan being on that show or show highlights of it after it happened. That was, it was like a trial run for him. This is going to be the same thing. And, I, and, and I'm okay with that because I think that if you're going to pay tribute to Mean Gene Okerlund, Hulk Hogan should be there. Hulk Hogan should be there just like in that Andre the Giant documentary that HBO did. Hulk Hogan had to be interviewed. You can't do a proper Andre the Giant documentary without talking to Hulk Hogan. So there are just going to be certain situations where I feel it's appropriate for him to, to, to speak or to show up or to just offer his comments in some way. Uh, and this is one of those times. Now, look, WWE is also flying Ric Flair to Raw tomorrow night. He's the other man who deserves to be there for any kind of mean gene tribute that they may be doing. So Hogan and Flair being there for one night, for me, is fine. Again, I'm not going to criticize other people who are up in arms about it because people have a right to not want to see Hulk Hogan on their TV. There are some people who will forever be offended by the things that he said. And who am I to sit there and say that they shouldn't be offended? They have every right to be offended. I'm just speaking for myself that if you're going to do a Mean Gene tribute, whatever their ulterior motives may be, I think it is perfectly appropriate to have Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair, and I actually want them on the show. I think they should be there. Now, I don't know if they're going to be out there cutting promos. I, I hope Hogan's not there just to pose. But 
I'm sure he and, and Flair will be there to say their piece, and Hogan will do the whole let me tell you something mean gene. Maybe it'll be like that meme that's been going around. You know, let me tell you something mean gene. We're going to miss you, brother. And then Ric Flair could be there to talk about mean by God gene. I mean, come on. How can you have a proper Okerlund tribute without that? But when I think of famous mean gene moments in WWE, I think of him interviewing Hogan backstage at Madison Square Garden the night that he won the championship for the very first time. Uh, go back and watch that. It's, it's actually funny. Hogan either hocked a big loogie or he accidentally spit out uh, his gum in the middle of that promo. Whatever it was, it went flying and it landed on Gene's jacket and the expression on his face. Uh, this guy was the fucking best when it came to his facial expressions during these segments. He could sell something just by his facial expression. He had this look of disgust on his face. Uh, then, of course, Andre came in. He poured the, the champagne on everybody. Rocky Johnson came in at the end of that promo. He poured some right on Gene's head. Uh, I think of the training vignettes, which are just, you watch them back now. It's just reeks of just the 1980s, which is why I love it so much. The vignettes, uh, you know, from, from when he and Hogan were teaming up in Minneapolis to do that one tag team match against George Steele and Mr. Fuji back in 84. And they had these vignettes where Hogan was, you know, waking up Gene at five in the morning and we got to go train. What are you doing? You're having bacon. You're smoking, a, as Hogan said, you're smoking a cigar. Because that's like when uh, Jim Ross was talking about the cement that got poured into the uh, Vince McMahon's Corvette. He called it cement. I guess that's just how they pronounce it down south. I think of all those times that the Iron Sheik would call him Gene Mean instead of Mean Gene. Uh, or when he would call him an intelligent Jew businessman. Uh, the funny thing is that the two of them in real life were enough friends that Okerlund was the best man at the Sheik's wedding. Uh, I think of those classic Randy Savage promos that he was there for. You know, the cup of coffee in the big time and and the beat goes on, and just all of those classic interviews. I'm not, I'm not sure how he was able to keep a straight face through most of them. Uh, I think of that time in 89, when the SummerSlam sign fell down behind him when he went to go start his interview with Ravishing Rick Rude, and uh, he blurted out, fuck it, like any, any of us would. Uh, now, Gene actually said that that blooper was taped earlier in the night, and what happened is when they threw it to the promo in the middle of the show, they aired the wrong tape. So for those of you wondering, hey, was that live and how else would that air? No, it wasn't live, but some uh, person in the truck put the wrong tape on. So that's what happened there. I think of the gobbledygooker debacle from Survivor Series 91, the big egg, the giant egg. And I think I think Gene was the one, I think, who even teased, oh, who's it going to be? Is it going to be a wrestler? Is it going to be the playmate of the month? And uh, then, of course, it's Hector Guerrero in a uh, San Diego chicken knockoff costume jumping out of the egg. And even people that night in the building booed. But Gene got in the ring with this guy, and he was dancing around. He tripped and fell. I still, to this day, don't know if that was legit or just, you know, part of the act. But uh, at least it, he didn't hurt himself, so that's good. I think of that famous night in Albany. In the 1992 Royal Rumble backstage with Ric Flair after his big victory, interviewing the new champion and stopping the interview to yell at somebody off camera to put that cigarette out. That seems to be the one thing everybody is is uh, citing I see on social media this week. Put that cigarette out. Well, I asked him about that. I had been, I'd been wondering this for years and years. And so when I had the chance to interview him and I sat down with him at WrestleCon a couple years ago, I said, I got to ask you about this. I said, what was the deal there? Who are you talking to? And after all these years, I expected some great story. It was a wrestler who lit up or something. And it turned out it was just some staff person. It was some kind of staff person who just went to go light up a cigarette. And Gene didn't smoke. I mean, cigars maybe, but not cigarettes. And he just told that person to put the cigarette out. And they they obliged. And that's it. <laughs> that's that's the, uh, the answer to the great mystery. Uh, Gene was in WWE through September of 1993, uh, when he left for WCW. Now, he didn't go right to WCW because Vince McMahon enforced a 60-day non-compete. So he didn't actually make his debut on WCW television until November. And I had some people ask me, like, can you talk about why he left? Why did he leave? He had a good thing going. Why would Mean Gene leave WWE? He claimed in his RF video shoot, that he did a number of years ago, that Vince McMahon chose not to renew his contract. Simple as that. Now, I've also read, 
uh, elsewhere over the years that he did have an offer, but it was for less money. He would have had to have taken a pay cut. Uh, I've heard both versions, but the version that Gene tells in that shoot, at least, is that his his deal just wasn't renewed. Uh, it's possible that he was offered a lower deal and is too embarrassed to, to say that, but whatever the case was, uh, they really didn't make a strong play for him, and so he ended up signing for more money with WCW. Plus, they gave him a cut of their hotline money. WCW already had a 900 number. But when Gene came in, he worked out a deal where he basically took it over, and he would get a cut of it. I, I, I remember reading, I think it was like 30 or 35%. He got a, a nice chunk of that WCW hotline. Uh, and for as long as I, I live, I will never forget that phone number. It is burned into my brain. one 900 9900 Kids, get your parents' permission before calling. You know, I called the WWF hotline. This is after he left uh, the company. But I called the WWF hotline once in 94. Actually, I think it was the night of the uh, King of the Ring pay-per-view in 94. And I called their hotline number for the first time. I, I called the hotline and... I never called one of those things again <laughs> once I realized what a scam that they were. Uh, but hey, more power to him. He made money off all the little fools like me who thought they were getting legitimate information by calling. It is interesting to note, at the time, uh, I know the Observer and the Torch each were reporting that the very first update that Gene recorded for the WCW hotline when he jumped over he claimed that he and Vince McMahon were hardly even on speaking terms his last couple of years in the company. Uh, and he had other negative things to say about them as well, about, about Vince, about the company. And yet, in his shoot interview, he claims that he left the company on really good terms. And he even gave Vince McMahon a hug in his office before they left. And he gave no indication that they weren't, you know, on, on speaking terms for two years. I mean, I find that very hard to believe. Uh, so I guess, you know, look, in a way, he was no different than everyone else who would leave. And, hey, he's playing for the other team now. And so he would kind of badmouth the competition, even if it wasn't true. Bobby Heenan, I have to say, Bobby Heenan was one of the only people, maybe the only guy, who left WWE and would not bash Vince McMahon. He would not say anything on Nitro when the other announcers would take little digs or Bischoff wanted them to. He would never say any cross words about the WWF because he was probably smart enough to realize, hey, I could end up back there someday. <laughs> Why am I going to burn that bridge? Or he just really enjoyed his time there. I know he, he really you know, didn't want to leave. He had a lot of fun working in WWE. Uh, and maybe he just didn't want to bash Vince. But he really is the only guy I could think of who never took any pot shots at, uh, at Vince McMahon. Uh, Gene's most famous moment, I would say, in WCW uh, came when Hulk Hogan turned heel, joined the NWO. Uh, Gene was in the ring to conduct the first interview with Heel Hogan immediately after he turned, and he's being pelted by garbage. Got hit right in the face at one point with something. He's feigning disgust. How much of that was feigning, I don't know. He probably was legitimately disgusted by all the crap people were throwing into the ring. I mean, this ring was filled with garbage. Uh, now imagine if you're somebody in Gene's position, right? You're not a you're not a big guy. You're standing there. People are throwing all of this crap. They could be throwing batteries. They could be throwing bottles. And he's got to stand there with stuff flying all around him. It's like like missiles and bombs falling. Like a soldier just standing in the field. Uh, so yeah, you know what? He probably wasn't very happy about that. But there he was, and he did his part to make sure that people reacted the way they wanted them to. And understood that Hogan had betrayed everybody in WCW. Not just the wrestlers, the fans, and even him. After all their years of friendship, he's like, you and I go back a long way. He did his part to help put that angle over the top. And that's one of the biggest angles, most successful money-making angles in wrestling history. And Gene played a part in that. Uh, the other great WCW promo uh, I think of uh, when he was there was when he interviewed Bret Hart backstage about his upcoming match with El Dandy. Yes, the infamous El Dandy promo. Who are you to doubt El Dandy? Uh, I want to show that to anybody who says that Bret Hart couldn't cut a promo to save his life. Forget the U.S. versus Canada stuff in WWE, which I also thought was some of the best work of his career in uh, in 97. 
Just show them this L Dandy promo from WCW and then tell me that Bret Hart can't cut a promo. I'll call you a liar. Uh, when WCW went under, he and Bobby Heenan were brought in to do commentary for the Gimmick Battle Royal at WrestleMania 17, uh, which I thought was great. And uh, and Gene did have some play-by-play -play experience. Not like he never did play-by-play -play before. He did. In the early days in WWE uh, and some of those old Coliseum video releases, he absolutely did do some play-by-play -play and actually wasn't bad at it. So they brought him in and Bobby Heenan in. It was a one-night-only thing. Unfortunately, they weren't brought back for any kind of recurring role or anything like that on, on television. Uh, but he was inducted, I said, into the Hall of Fame in 06. Uh, it ended with him saying that when he dies, he wants to be buried face down so that all of his critics can kiss his ass, which is an old uh, Coach uh, Bobby Knight quote. Uh, pop culture, you know, I was just jotting down what are what are some of the pop culture references I could think of from Mean Gene, because his death got a lot of press attention this week. Like, more than you would think, more than most wrestlers get. That's how much of a, kind of an influence he had, I think, on a lot of those fans who grew up in, in the mid to late 80s. I mean, I saw articles from every major press outlet this week uh, about the death of Gene Okerlund. And back in the day, you know, he was on the Hulk Hogan Rock and Wrestling cartoon, he was on an episode of The A-Team uh, with Hogan and a bunch of the other wrestlers, uh, even just recently, just a few months ago, he was in a Mountain Dew commercial with Kevin Hart. So this guy never stopped working, never stopped traveling around. He hit all the big wrestling conventions. That's how I got to interview him at WrestleCon. He came to WrestleCon in Orlando in 2017. I was doing the stuff for Fight TV, you know, that day, going around interviewing a whole bunch of different people. And I have to thank Fight TV for that, and I have to thank Damian Nelson. Shout out to him for that as well, because without his help, that doesn't happen. And that was a big deal for me personally. You know, and, and the, the kind words he had for me when we wrapped up and we were just chatting is, is something I'll never forget. Uh, his final WWE television appearance came last year, about a year ago now, the 25th anniversary of Raw. Uh, where he interviewed the then WWE champion, AJ Styles. Uh, I can't think of many people better than that, you know, to, to be his final interview. But he was actually just on the latest Edge and Christian show episode on the network, literally less than a week ago. He was one of the people they interviewed for their sketch on the mystery of kayfabe. Uh, he was the narrator for that WWE Storytime show, which is legitimately one of my favorite shows on the network. Uh, and just last week... He appeared alongside Charlie Caruso on the WWE Vintage series that airs uh, in international markets. Um, I mean, it may, it may have been taped a month or so ago, but it just aired last week. And so he was still hosting shows for WWE right up until the day he died. Uh, he was married, you know, to his wife Jeannie 55 years, I think just shy of 55 years. His road wife was uh, Bobby Heenan. I would call him his, uh, his road wife. Bobby Heenan is up there with Gorilla Monsoon. Now all three of them are together again. And uh, that's one hell of a roster they've got up there. I'm here with WWE Hall of Famer Mean Gene Okerlund here at WrestleCon 2017. Uh, Gene, you've done a few events like this in your day. What's it like to be out amongst the fans meeting people at WrestleCon? Well, of course, it's uh, very exciting. I mean, this, 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 this whole landscape of the WrestleMania week, it's not just a, a day or a night. I mean, it's a whole week of festivities and fans from literally all over the world, Jason, come to this event. And it's uh, kind of a, a melting pot, if you will, of wrestling fans from the WWE universe. Well, really, it's wrestling fans from all over, and, and you're a recognized name. I believe next month you're celebrating 46 years in the uh, wrestling business, I believe. Uh, <laughs> Don't let anybody know it'll about that. It'll be our that. secret. That's Nobody has to you know. And I, it's just between you and I. from Brooklyn, please. Oh, well, you know, that's uh, it'll be our little secret. But, you know, we talk about WrestleMania. Obviously, we're here for WrestleMania weekend. And you've been a part of a lot of WrestleManias in your day, including the very first WrestleMania. My question to you is, of all the WrestleManias that you've been a part of, is there one moment for you that stands out above all the rest as your favorite? Well, of course, uh, early on, I think it, it, a lot more... Uh, impressionable upon guys like myself that were working uh, in the in the pits if you will and uh, Wrestlemania 1 certainly made a big statement that was either the the end or the beginning for uh, WWF back in those days 
and uh, what an event it turned out to be. Way beyond my expectations. I mean, when you bring in Muhammad Ali and Billy Martin and Liberace and the Radio City Rockettes, and then to have a, a lineup like they had for WrestleMania truly was something. The other one stands in my mind is the grandeur of WrestleMania three at the Silver Dome in Pontiac. But hey, listen, it seems to me they just keep getting better. So what can I say? Can I pick out one? No. Can you? Well, to me, they all kind of blend together. You have all the, the, the grandiose nature of it. I mean, it's hard to just nail down one. Yeah. I haven't had the opportunity to be part of as many as you have, though. Well, I've, I've uh, I missed just uh, but a handful, I think, uh, seven grand total. So that means I've been around for 26 or 27. But I will say this. I still look forward to this event every year. We have other, you know, great uh, pay-per-view events, extravaganzas like... Uh, Survivor and uh, the Royal Rumble, but there's nothing quite like WrestleMania. And I think it's the aura, the people that you see, you come here, you meet old friends. You don't have any old friends because you're not old, but I do. Well, you, you, could, be, you could be my friend. Okay, well, I'll, I'll buy that. In, in the art of doing a wrestling interview, there's two things you need to do. You need to listen and you need to react. Do you think that that's become something of a lost art in wrestling? I truly do. I don't think there's a, a straight interview out there, and I'm not going to uh, badmouth anybody because whatever the formula, the model is today, it's working. So you can't really argue with success. However, the art of a kind of a semi-shoot interview, I think, is gone. And uh, the reactions are so animated that it's just not quite like it would have been with, with a Hulk Hogan or a Randy Savage or a Rowdy Rowdy Piper. I mean, I can go on and on and on. Ric Flair, talk about spontaneity. That's where it was. Well, you know, you mentioned Randy Savage. He's obviously a favorite of a lot of people. I mean, I'm, I'm sporting a Randy Savage shirt right now myself. Why not? Why not? And uh, you were part of a lot of his most memorable interviews, and he had a lot of them. What was it like working with Macho Man when you were on set doing interviews with him? There is a guy you really didn't know what to expect, and I think that was kind of the magic of the way he operated. Nobody ever knew where he was coming from. Uh, half of it was off the wall. Half of it was off, well, I don't want to say here. This is a, a televised program. It is. Right? It's a family program. Yeah, I'll keep this uh, as much family as I can. But uh, Randy was, I mean, he was one of a kind. Very professional, by the way. He thought about everything that he did. But he was a great storyteller, not only behind a microphone and a camera, but also in the ring. Great storyteller. Is there a match at WrestleMania this weekend that you are looking forward to more than any other? Is there any match that intrigues you the most? No, actually, uh, there's, there's a, a couple of the top matches that we're all going to be looking at. But the entire card, I think, is just packed with talent. Uh, I mean, we've got the uh, multi-person uh, events that are going to be taking place, but I mean, Goldberg and Lesnar. I mean, that thing has been teed up now for quite a while. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes uh, Triple H going against Seth Rollins and uh, Roman Reigns and the, un uh, the Undertaker back. There's one. I got to tell you, I'm going to be sitting on the edge of my seat, probably having a cold beverage while I am enjoying that one because. Uh, He's one of my favorites. Well, what do you think about that run that he's had? I mean, do you think that anybody will ever have a run the way The Undertaker has had? Uh, well, I'm not going to live to see it, but I, I would have to doubt that you would ever, uh, you'd ever have a, a record like he has amassed at WrestleMania. And that is a, I mean, it's, it's kind of a signature event at WrestleMania because it just happened year after year after year and a bona fide success. I have to ask you about this. You mentioned the Royal Rumble a little while ago. I'm sure this is a question you get, you know, from time to time. Now, my favorite Rumble is the 1992 Royal Rumble. I'm sure a lot of people would concur. And you are uh, in the annals of history in, in interviewing Ric Flair when that Rumble was over. And off camera, there was something that happened, and you made the comment about putting the cigarette out. And I've always wanted to ask you, 
who are you talking to? If you remember, like what, what was going on in that moment where, where that moment came about? Well, I didn't think we could conduct business uh, with a, uh, a, a tainted atmosphere. So I asked a young man who was kind of uh, sitting adjacent to us to, uh, to put out that cigarette. And, uh, and he did very kindly, and it all worked out. And you know what happened after that with Flair. He went, well, kind of flippo. Well, I, it, it's good to have the mystery solved, at least, yeah, after all these leader, years. by the way, is a non-smoker, as I am. I hope you don't smoke. No, not at all. No. I got a great cigar, though, in my bag you might like. Well, we can talk about that when we're done here. Not rolled by anybody in particular, but I think it might be from Cuba. Well, Gene, let me, let me ask you this. I mean, you, you've done a lot of these events, and it just seems like you're not slowing down. I know you're going to be at the Hall of Fame. You're going to be at WrestleMania. Uh, do you still enjoy it now as much as you did 30 years ago? Absolutely. A little less involvement than I had in, in, in previous years, and it's kind of really worked out very well for me because we not sinking into the sunset, mind you, Jason, but uh, at least having an opportunity to be part of the big show, of the big event, of the big spectacular, of WrestleMania. Hall of Fame, Pat Patterson and myself will be sitting there, may have a little concoction under the chair that will be working from time to time, but uh, Hall of Fame is very, very entertaining. And you never know what's gonna happen there either because that is spontaneity. Well, Gene, listen, you are, you are the bona fide Hall of Famer. This has been an honor for me to, to speak with you and enjoy the weekend here at WrestleCon. Yeah, uh, and I'm, I'm here with uh, a lot of great guys. And as I said, the reunion, I'm going to be seeing Kevin Nash, Shawn Michaels. I'm going to be seeing Triple H, not necessarily here, but seeing all of these guys makes it really worth the trip, worth my while, and what a weekend it is. Gene, thank you. Jason? Thank you. I'll see you in Brooklyn. Absolutely. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to count on that. Yeah, very, very good Italian restaurant there. I don't know if the people are still moving around quite as well as they used to. I'll even pick up the tab. You'll pick up the tab? I will gladly pick up the tab. Whoa, we got a million-dollar man on our hands right here. I hope this is not being recorded. I don't think so. Back to you. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Jason. Thank you.